All right. I'm Coretta Scott King, and I was born in the year 1927, April 27. I was born 80 miles outside of Montgomery, Alabama, on a farm. My grandparents owned 300 acres of land. And my mother, Bernice, she had a drumbeat that she told us all the time. Children, when you get older, you make sure you get your education. Because that way, you won't be somebody. And nobody going to be able to kick you around. And girls, <coughs> you make sure you somebody so you don't have to depend on nobody. Not even a man. <laughs> well, my sister Edith and I, we really took her words to heart. We started off in a one room schoolhouse. About 100 children from first grade to sixth grade, three to four months of the year, we were able to go to school. But then we went on to Lincoln High. My father, Obadiah, and Bernice Scott. They worked hard and saved to send us to Lincoln High, which was started by abolitionists in Marion. Well, we had black teachers and black teachers. All the students, we were all black. But that was the first time I was nurtured by white people. It felt so good. And from there, I went on to Antioch College, where my sister Edith was the first black student to attend Antioch. I got a scholarship to go there, and while I was there, I decided to major in music. I want to be a concert singer and study in Paris at the Metropolitan Opera House, and from there go to Rome and Moscow, San Francisco, New York, Detroit, Chicago, New York. Anywhere <laughs> except the South. <laughs> so after I graduated from Antioch, I got a scholarship to go to the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston. It was the year 1951. I was excited. I was deep into my studies. And then in January of 1952, I received a phone call, and it changed all my plans. Ring, ring, ring. Oh, yes, this is Coretta Scott. Oh, Coretta, this is Mary Powell, your classmate. Ah, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing just fine. You know, I'm just studying my music here. Coretta, have you met Martin Luther King Jr.? No, no, I have not met him. Who is he? Oh, well, he's a student at Boston University. He's working on his PhD in systematic theology. He's from Atlanta. He went to Morehouse while I was at Spelman. He's a very nice man. And I told him all about you. He really wants to meet you. Oh, Mary, I just don't have time to meet anybody. No, that's all right. I don't want to meet him. Oh, but Coretta, oh, he's going to be a Baptist minister. What? A Baptist minister? Oh, they're boring and narrow-minded. <laughs> they wear black suits. I'm from the AME church, you know, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and we're quiet, and they are so loud. Oh, no, I definitely do not want to be together. Oh, but Coretta, he's not boring. He's very well-spoken. You will like him. Just please. He told me he was quite cynical about the woman around here. And he wants to be someone with style and charm. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you 
give me, you to give him my phone number. Well, a few hours later, <laughs> ring, ring. Hello, this is Coretta Scott. Oh, Coretta, this is Martin Luther King Jr. And I've been wanting to meet you. A mutual friend has given me your phone number. She has told me so many wonderful things about you. When can we meet? Well, I have a full schedule, but on Thursday, I have a couple hours between classes. Maybe we can meet for lunch. Oh, I would like to do that. It usually takes me about 10 minutes to get to the conservatory from Boston University, but I'll get there in seven. All right. <laughs> Well, that Thursday, I put on a powdered blue wool suit and buttoned up my black jacket and waited outside my dormitory. And there he comes, down the street, in a green 1951 Chevy. And I get into the car and I'm thinking, hmm, he's a little bit short. <laughs> I find out he's two years younger than me. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm two years older than him. <laughs> yes. But we went on and had lunch at this restaurant about four blocks away from the school. And we talked about this and that and all about things going on in the world. And he was so surprised that I knew what was going on in the world, that my mind wasn't just into music. He was really surprised. And he kept staring at my hair and my face and just looking at me so intently. And then after lunch, we got back into the car. And at a stop sign, at a stop light, he put his arm on the back of the chair and he looks at me and he says, Coretta, you have everything I want in a wife. <laughs> You've got personality, character, intelligence, and beauty. When can I see you again? Wow. Um, I'll check my schedule. Just give me a call later on. <laughs> and that night, I could hardly sleep. Here's this man talking to me about matrimony on our first date. Oh. Music is my first love. I, this is the 1950s. A woman gets married, she becomes a housewife and has children. She doesn't have a career. Oh. And you know, I had looked at him intently, making sure that he wasn't joking when he was talking about matrimony. But no, he was very serious. Hmm. Well, we went out again on Saturday, and that night afterwards, he talked about matrimony again. <laughs> and we kept going out. We'd go bowling. We'd go roller skating. Oh, he's a really good dancer. Oh, he could do the foxtrot and the waltz. And he could do the jitterbug, too. But he told me that once he becomes a minister, that he's going to have to give up dancing. <clears throat> <laughs> he also told me that when he becomes a minister, he wants to be a minister in the South. That's where his people needed him the most. The South. Oh, I could already feel the shackles of Jim Crow back around my ankles again. Oh, but my sister liked him, everybody liked him, and I realized. I could be out on the stage singing, but my life was more than just being on the stage. I had to make a difference. That's what my father had taught us. That's what my teachers had all taught us. And so I made a decision to fall in love with Martin Luther King, Jr. <laughs>